Welcome to another edition of the Voice of Palestine, Voice of the Palestinian People. It's January 3rd, 2014, and I'm your co-host, Hanna Kawas. This week we are interviewing David Heap, a spokesperson for Gaza Arc, who will update us on the status of the campaign, their projected spring 2014 sailing, as well as what people can do to help. Uh, good evening to you, David, and welcome again to the Voice of Palestine. Good evening, uh, Hanna. It's a pleasure to be with you again. Uh, you know, the, let's uh, start with the anniversary, uh, uh, you know, the uh, aggression on Gaza in 2008 started, uh, I believe, the December 27, and continued uh, to, for a couple of weeks, for three weeks actually, and uh, uh, or a bit less, but uh, you know, it, it really uh, uh, upsetting to see that the conditions uh, are getting worse than five years ago, and uh, Israel is not having been called to task for their crimes that they committed then. That's true. Yes, it, it is a very sad anniversary, and it, it's uh, even sadder because the world uh, continues to uh, not demand accountability from, from the rogue state of Israel and not demand uh, respect for international law in the treatment of, of occupied Palestine, in particular occupied and blockaded uh, Gaza, the, mo the most blockaded part of all of Palestine. Mm -hmm. But this is why... We continue to act in, in our movement, the, the Canadian Book for Gaza and of Gaza's Arc and the International Freedom Flotilla Coalition, um, as grassroots civil society organizations, because we know, uh, we've observed what the Palestinian people know, that they, they cannot uh, depend on the states of the world or the governments of the world who mm -hmm. forget them. They Sometimes they say, say a few words, but less and less, and they do very little action. Um, so it's really a people of conscience, a civil society organizations, grassroots organizations, uh, who uh, are the ones who remember the, the situation of Palestine, and in particular the situation of blockaded Gaza. Yeah. Uh, yeah so we have to continue. Yeah. Uh, what was that, David? I say, so we have to continue. Oh, yeah, for uh, sure. Because where, where, where the leaders, the so-called leaders don't lead, it's the people who have to lead. Sure. And eventually yeah. the, they will yeah. figure it out. Yeah. I want to also draw attention that the last ceasefire that was brokered by uh, Morsi when he was in power in Egypt, you know, mm -hmm. I remember, you know, people saying, oh, why are you bothering, you know, with the Gaza Arc and the uh, Gaza Solidarity Work? Uh, you know, Israel uh, agreed to <laughs> let in, uh, you know, more supplies, and, you know, now Morsi is allowing uh, things, so there is no need for you. But obviously that was false sense of uh, uh, security uh, yeah. uh, and relief for uh, the Gazan people and for everybody all over the world, don't you think? Yes. Yeah. Yes, it's always uh, a false sense of security for, for many reasons. I mean, yeah. even while the Morsi government continued, in the first few months there were continued attacks from Israel on Palestinian civilians everywhere, and in particular in, in the West Bank. So the ceasefire was unilaterally violated immediately mm. by Israel, and they continued their violations. Um, even during, as I said, the, the, Mar the continued Mar Morsi government for the first, part of, first half of 2013, um, but no country, no people should depend on their neighbor's goodwill or the neighbor's free passage for traveling and trading with the world. It, it, uh, it, it's impossible to think. I, I always try to think of a Canadian analogy, but if we imagined, you know, New Brunswick could only access the world through one crossing into Maine mm -hmm. and not through their own seacoast, uh, nobody would think that that's a normal state of affairs. No matter how good or bad your relations are with your neighbor, you shouldn't depend on your neighbor yeah. to get in and out. Right? So um, e Egypt has always been in this contradictory world. They're not the source of the problem. The source of the problem, of course, is the Israeli blockade. They are more or less complicit with the, the, the Israeli blockade, depending mm -hmm. on 
the situation. So for a few years, there was still military cooperation with the Egyptian military, with the uh, uh, Israeli military, because everybody knows they received lots of uh, military aid from the U.S., yeah. but the government in Egypt was more favorable, but then now they're not. So the source of the problem was somewhere else. Egypt is only part of the problem, and the crossing at Rafah can only ever be a small part of the solution. The real solution is full freedom of movement for Palestinians everywhere, and in particular for the Palestinians of Gaza. Yeah. Also part of the deal was also that Israel would allow more uh, supplies to come from the Hanun, Beit Hanun crossing, which they call Eretz. Yes. Of course, this doesn't last. Yeah, <laughs> also, last. didn't last. Yeah. So and they also were supposed to get back some of the fishing uh, yeah. waters that were stolen yeah. under, you know, even under the Oslo Accords, the Jericho Accords, part of the Oslo Agreement. They were supposed to have 20 nautical miles. Yeah. It was pushed back to 12, pushed back to six, it pushed back to three, and they very magnanimously gave them back six. <laughs> yeah. For a few months, and then they push them back to three, and even in the within those three or six nautical miles, yeah. where they can't yeah. fish very much because it's the coastal waters, it's very shallow and very polluted. Yeah. Um, yeah. They still uh, get shot at, and the fishing boats still get attacked and stolen, and the fishermen yeah. still get uh, injured and, and detained. So even the small gains, and they were really quite modest gains mm -hmm. uh, from the ceasefire last November. Mm -hmm. um, November 2012, yes. uh, were, were short-lived. And I think this is the important thing, is that while we're all relieved, of course, that the, the shooting the, and the bombing and so forth came to an end, mm -hmm. a ceasefire is not peace. A ceasefire yes. is just yes. that, a ceasefire. Yes. Real peace yes. needs real freedom and real respect for rights yes. to be a lasting peace. Yes. And without justice, there can't be a lasting peace. There can yes. only be a ceasefire. And so uh, all of these things are all, uh, at best, temporary gains. Yes, yes. yes. And uh, also collective punishment is not peace, you know, like... Uh, no. Yeah. no, this is <laughs> I mean, a they're, they're systematic doing it, like denial you of said. rights. Yes. Every, every, every imaginable right that uh, an occupied person, people should have Mm. under international law is, is, is violated. You know, the right of freedom of movement, yeah. the right to, to have a normal economy, the right to an education, the right to mm. um, family unification, all of these things are systematically violated by the occupation. Yeah. Yeah. So collective punishment uh, is incompatible with with human rights and incompatible with, with uh, any kind of lasting peace. Yeah, transferring prisoners to the occupied uh, power uh, territory, that's also against the for Geneva Convention in addition Absolutely. to what they're doing in the West Bank, building settlements and transferring their population to the West Bank, which is all against the Fourth, International, uh, fourth Geneva Convention and against uh, all international law uh, provisions. Mm -hmm. You know, but, uh, you know, um, it's it's really, uh, um, you know, sometimes you think uh, that, that the world has waken up, but, uh, you know, once Gaza is not in the news anymore, you know, uh, and this is true, by the way, for the Solidarity Movement. I don't know if you uh, experience that yourself. If Gaza is not in the news, then we don't worry about Gaza. Yes, unfortunately, even the Solidarity Movement suffers from a very short attention span. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it's our job to keep it, if not in the news, at least in the minds of people yeah. of conscience. Yeah, in minds um, and hearts. The news is very fickle. You know, if we depend on the news media, the, the, the mainstream yeah. uh, corporate media, um, <clears throat> I think we, yeah. we would be in a very hopeless situation. We depend, of course, on alternate media like yours, but also that uh, grassroots organizations, trade unions, student groups, people groups will keep their members in, in, informed um, because, of course, uh, it falls out of the media's attention yeah. because they, they move on to the next crisis. Um, yeah. But our decision, my, our local group, uh, People for Peace in London, decided actually at the time of cast lead that we wouldn't uh, we would keep this focus, that we wouldn't uh, abandon the cause of the Palestinians of Gaza, uh, because uh, I remember actually it was a year later at the time of the Gaza Freedom March in. Um, Mm -hmm. uh, so it was 2009-10. Uh, in Cairo, there were 1,400 internationals from many parts of the world who tried to go to Gaza by land, and we were stopped. This was in Mubarak's Egypt, of course. Yeah. We were stopped 
there was militarized uh, blockades who couldn't get out of uh, couldn't get mostly get out of Cairo, and there were many people from different places. But I remember in particular a trade unionist from from Kosatu, from the Congress of South African Trade Unions, mm-hmm. who said to us, "You know, sisters and brothers, it doesn't matter what we do this week or this month for Palestine." Mm-hmm. She said, it, "What matters is what we do for Palestine for how many decades." Because yes. that's how long she will meet us, right? Yes. And coming from a South African, of course, this puts it in the proper perspective. Mm-hmm. <laughs> These are people that uh, defeated apartheid. Yes. They understand that solidarity is not a, a one day or a one week or a one year yes. commitment. Also, it's for the long haul. Yeah, also, it's not a really a charity like you always emphasize at the Gaza Arc, that it's not really a charity. No, no. Yeah. Not at all. I mean, yeah. the difference is. Charity is is uh, unidirectional and, and humiliating, and solidarity is is uh, horizontal mm. and empowering for yeah. for both sides. Yeah, and I like so this, that. This is very yeah. important. Yeah, it's very important. Yeah, you that, emphasize uh, that really all the time. That the uh, exactly mm. the, the the flotilla is not doing something for Palestinians; is doing something with Palestinians. Yeah. Uh, and uh, in particular, this project, our current uh, campaign yeah. uh, with Gaza Zark. Uh, you know, it's not about us sailing there because the important thing is that Palestinians have to have the freedom of movement, yes. not that internationals should have the freedom of movement to sail there. Yeah, no, that's very important. Also, as as, as uh, equally important is uh, the Palestinian uh, themselves know how to resist the occupation, and uh, we shouldn't really impose on them or tell them you should do this or should do that. I mean, uh, advice is okay, but mm-hmm. not uh, try to. Tell them we know better than you, <laughs> which no. is really hypocritical on many uh, no, parts. No. Yeah, so absolutely, we yeah. come we come to learn. Yeah, yeah. Uh, lessons of, yeah. of no, first of important. all, of sumut of uh, steadfastness. Yeah, yeah uh, you know, from from the Palestinian uh, people and their yeah. their uh, heroic resistance. Yeah. No, I, we're I, in a position of learning. Yeah, yeah I know. I, I think uh, the Gaza Arc uh, proved that. Uh, in addition to all these people who participated participated in uh, the ISM, the International Solidarity Movement. They're there to uh, give solidarity rather than, you know, tell them what to do, really, uh, as some, some groups here, and we don't want to mention names, really, but, you know, the, that's, uh, that's the trend. But I want to talk, to, uh, you know, I mean, uh, really, the last uh, last month was really harsh on Gazans because of the floods. Could you talk a little bit about it? And, uh, uh, yes. Where the, the, the really, Israel made it worse, uh, uh, if you could tell us a bit about that. Of course. I mean, it's it's one of the things about this work is we speak regularly to our, our, our partners and our, the people we work with in, in Gaza. So we hear about their day-to-day situation, you know, uh, regularly and every every couple times a week. And um, there, there are some bad natural circumstances, but the thing we must keep in mind is that the, the situation is an unnatural disaster. It is not, not a mm-hmm. natural disaster. Mm-hmm. So when it rains heavily or snows in that part of the world, of course, it's an exceptional uh, circumstance. But if people are able to lead a normal life, they can make arrangements for that. But if uh, the occupier opens a flood uh, dam upstream from Gaza, as happened in Israel, then they get flooded in, you know, already in crowded refugee camps like uh, Jebediah yeah. and the other camps. Then they get even more <laughs> water than they can deal with because they're downstream. Yeah. Um, they already lost power, so the, the because of the blockade and because of the Egyptian enforcement of the blockade on the tunnel. So mm-hmm. they had no, uh, like very little electricity. Uh, they were not running the uh, sewage treatment or the pumps or anything like this. So there was not just a flood of water, but a flood of sewage, uh, and of course a shortage of, of heat and people people yeah. being very cold. And I mean the tragic thing is not that bad conditions happen. Bad conditions happen in, in many parts of the world at many times, including in Canada. The bad thing has, that is that this is completely avoidable. This is a result of political decisions by the occupier, by Israel, a political decision by Egypt to be complicit mm-hmm. with the occupier. Uh, and we're talking about you know, a military coup government in Egypt, not a democratic government, but mm-hmm. a military coup who takes this position, but also by our own governments who are complicit with it and yeah. enable uh, Israel to continue doing this. Because Israel gets away with this because we allow them to get away with this, not, not just because they do it, but because our governments allow them to do it. So ultimately, the, res- the, the responsibility comes back to us. Mm-hmm. And, and 
our governments and the people that are uh, running our countries that make, allow this to happen. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I just w like to draw some parallels. Like uh, we we had uh, here in Canada, in uh, especially in Toronto, uh, severe uh, uh, storm there, and the electricity was cut for a few days. And you know, uh, Gaza's electricity being cut for God knows how many years. You know, they they live on maybe four hours a day or less than that. Exactly. And exactly, yes. Yeah, and sometimes none at all. Yeah. So uh, you know, uh, the, these people uh, in Toronto, not that you don't sympathize with them, but you 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 feel that maybe they should be in or in general our Canadian. Uh, uh, population should be in their shoes and see how it feels to live without electricity where you can't even refrigerate your food, you know, because it's going to get spoiled here. I, I saw the other day on TV, I was amazed, you know, I mean, they're, they're giving a uh, um, $100 uh, um, gift cards for people who lost uh, their food and the refrigeration, and they showed someone with a BMW with 50,000 going and collecting that. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, it's really, <laughs> you know, it says quite a bit about, you know, humanity. I mean, uh, if you don't feel with other people, I think uh, you, you're missing uh, part of your humanity. Uh, and I think it's important to, uh, to have solidarity with everyone that faces such conditions rather than just be selective about it yeah. yeah yes and of course demand better of of our own government yeah I mean people for a, for a time will will yeah. be questioning uh, the accountability of the Ford government yeah. in Toronto and the provincial government of Ontario and so forth uh, and then of course they will move on to the next short yeah. attention span but uh, at least in this case they demand accountability of their own government when there are these crimes permit, committed not for a week or a month but for year after year mm -hmm. on the Palestinian uh, Palestinians of Gaza we have no call for, for accountability yeah. from our uh, our government yeah. so, so this is a big difference when it affects people they or people they know uh, people may demand uh, some kind of accountability yeah. but in the case of Gaza there is a, a blackout of power but also a blackout of political attention and political accountability and in general uh, you know uh, collective punishment <laughs> in every aspect of life you know whether it's education or food or you know services every every aspect of life so uh, you no, know, I was really touched by you mentioned education I mean because I'm an educator Mm. I, I, we were at the university when I was there in the, the fall of 2012, and uh, you know, meet these young people who are so keen to reach the outside world and interact and, and talk to people from the outside. And, and this, for me, is is part of the real challenge tragedy. I mean, mm. it's tragic for everybody. It's tragic for the grandmothers and for the grandchildren, for everybody. But uh, you know, I particularly feel the case of the young people who were frustrated this fall. They wanted to go and continue their studies, and there were thousands of them blocked mm -hmm. at uh, Rafa crossing um, <clears throat> by by the Egyptians uh, applying the Israeli blockade, right? And they yeah. couldn't get out there, they couldn't get out through Beit Hanun, they couldn't, uh, they just couldn't uh, continue their, their, their studies. And, you know, I think of the, yeah. these bright young people who only want to better their knowledge to better their communities, mm -hmm. right? It's really uh, uh, an act of hope in these cases to uh, to try to get an education. And what I'm always reminded of is if you take the hope away from a generation of young people, it's not surprising if some of them then turn to hopeless yeah. acts. Right. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's not a very complicated equation yeah. uh, that, you know, uh, later we will say, well, why are they doing these desperate things? Well, we we were complicit in taking, our governments, our states were complicit in taking away the hope. What do you expect to happen? Yeah. Yeah, it's not that surprising. Yeah. So I think this is, brings me back to the, the mm. one of the slogans on our campaign of Gaza's Ark is building hope because uh, we're not just helping to build an old, rebuild an old fishing boat in the port of Gaza. It's a small symbolic act of hope to say we believe in the the people, the Palestinian people of Gaza, a right to determine their own economic future and their own social and political future. And part of their hope, not all of it, but part of their hope lies in an open sea trading route. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, so building hope is more important in a sense than building a boat yeah. or you know filling the boat with export products. All of these are concrete steps 
but the the political gesture is one of hope, and I think that this is very important. Yes, it when is. I think of the agriculturalists uh, who see their orchards and their crops destroyed, not once, but time and time again, and then they go back and they plant, once again, olive trees. Yes. And I think if these people can still plant olive trees, which you don't do for yourself, right? you, you, you plant olive trees for your children and your children's children, right? Yes. Um, then we don't have the right to give up hope. This is a very hopeful act when you plant olive trees. Oh, sure, yeah. And, uh, and, and uh, we have to do what we can to accompany them in this, in this yeah. hope. Yeah, it takes a generation to bear fruit, the olive trees. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, uh, they, they plant them for the future, for the future uh, generations. Right. Um, yeah, um, I think, you know, you touched on uh, Canadian government complicity, uh, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, that the Egyptians really uh, do what the Israelis tell them it's, it's more than what the Israelis, it's what the Americans, because they are the one who footing the bill. And the mm -hmm. Canadian is as complicit, if not more, than the Canadian government mm -hmm. in, in these war crimes that Israel is committing on a daily basis. And, you know, again, it's against the Four Geneva Convention, which Canada is a signatory to. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, exactly. they, they should be called to task, you know, if there is if there is an international court that is objective, they should be there, you know, when when the time comes. Yes, they should, absolutely. And, uh, of course, all, all we can do for now is record yeah. the injustices and uh, try to give voice to the Palestinian people and say yeah. this is a cause of, of universal justice. Yeah. And if we don't get them now, uh, we'll get them eventually. Oh, yeah, Another for name. sure, for sure. And Another that's, names and, uh, that's the uh, hope you're talking no, about, yeah. Name. That's the hope you, are, yeah. you were talking about, you know, because for sure uh, justice will prevail sooner or later. Can, can we go uh, to um, the uh, project and uh, mm -hmm. what's uh, update us on what's happening there and uh, is it still on schedule? Yes. So we changed, we probably spoke since the summer with, with say, for somebody like that from our campaign. So we changed the, the sailing plans to the spring and it is on schedule for sailing in the spring of 2014. Um, the boat is currently out of the water, so they're cleaning the hull, the underwater part of the of the hull, um, painting and doing some other repairs. Uh, but in a short time, it will be back in the water, and they will complete, you know, the cargo and the cargo hold and the cabins and all the technical components to sail. So it will be ready to sail in the spring of 2014. Our challenge now is uh, to work with uh, our partners in Gaza and uh, civil society around the world to fill her with cargo purchases, mm -hmm. because this is not just uh, an act of uh, political direct action against the blockade. That's one piece of it. We sail against the blockade because we're also sailing against our own government's policies. It's also an act of solidarity in that we are people are buying the export goods of Palestinians in Gaza, um, because this actually, Palestinians in all of Palestine, mostly from Gaza, but a few products from elsewhere in Palestine will also be on board. Mm -hmm. um, and this is, again, as, as you were saying earlier, not our idea. This is an idea that came from our partners in Gaza who said, we don't want to be the recipients of aid coming from the outside. We want to have our own economy. We want to export because Gaza always was an, uh, mm -hmm. an active, vibrant export economy until, uh, until the blockade, really, uh, and until gas-led destroyed so much of the industry and so much of the, the agricultural production. Okay. So, again, it's a small boat. We will have about 50 cubic meters, about one container load of, of cargo, but uh, it's an important gesture to say that these people, the, these producers, and they're you know, small agricultural producers, small uh, craft co-ops in, in the communities in, in Gaza, they have the right to sell to the outside world. In fact, people are already buying their goods from our, in our European campaign partners uh, and some here in North America. So this is a, a very concrete way people can help Whatever happens, see, so this is the beauty of it, because before people said, well, your boats, you know, in 2005, 2008, the boats, five voyages got to Gaza. But after that, there were many boats that were stopped and stolen by Israel. The beauty in this case is whatever happens on the voyage, and that doesn't depend on us, it depends on the occupier. Mm -hmm. The Palestinian uh, producers in Gaza will be paid for their products. So we need buyers who are willing to share some of the risk with us, with the Palestinians. We can't all sail on the ship. It's a small boat, right? And at this point, it's very difficult to get into Gaza as well to join the voyage. 
Yeah. But everybody can share a little part of the commercial risk, which is the risk of living as a Palestinian in Gaza these days. People, farmers plant their crops. They don't know whether they're going to be able to harvest it. You know, they plant their olives. They don't know whether they're going to harvest the olives. They, you know, women's cooperatives do their beautiful traditional embroidery. They don't know if anybody will buy them. They don't know if they'll be able to buy more thread to make another embroidery, right? So we can't live all of those risks, but we can share part of it by saying, we believe in you, we believe in your economy, we will buy mm-hmm. a portion of this cargo from our community. Some, you know, uh, business person or community group or solidarity association in Vancouver or in mm-hmm. Ontario or in the States or in Australia or in Europe or in South Africa uh, will buy a part of this cargo knowing the risks. Mm-hmm. sharing the risk of the voyage, and, very importantly, um, demanding, once they are the owners of this cargo, they will have a bill of lading that says they are owners of cargo from these producers in Gaza. Before we sail, these people will, uh, purchasers, will demand accountability of their, from their governments in a new way. In the past, we've always been frustrated because we demand accountability of our governments for human rights for Palestinians. This time we will come to them and say, we want respect for our rights as a Canadian resident who has purchased goods overseas. So we're using the rhetoric of trade, which is a new approach, right? We have these neoliberal and conservative governments who say they believe in trade. Well, now we will take them at their word and say, show us that we will, you uh, also support trade with uh, the occupied Palestinian territories, mm-hmm. in particular with Gaza. So it changes the discourse a little bit. Yeah. Uh, it allows us to open another side of the debate with our very conservative governments here and in the States and in other parts of the world who are very pro-Zionist, as you said, yeah. and uh, show the hypocrisy of their position if they don't support the sailing of a peaceful boat from Gaza. Yeah. To do this, we need people to buy goods. Yes. Yeah. yeah they, we have Arabic proverb, uh, David, that says, if you're shameless, you'll do whatever you want. And this Canadian government and U.S. government are saying shameless. Eventually, they'll yeah. do what they want. And I don't know if you remember just uh, the last session of the General Assembly. They voted against many resolutions, including human rights uh, resolution for the Palestinians. Uh, the, uh, mm-hmm. And they were one of the few countries that uh, voted against it. You know, which is really shameless. But uh, this is the reality, and I'm not saying, you know, it does change the discourse, like you said, because they don't have any excuse. It exposes them more and exposes uh, them the, what they really are to the people, and especially uh, re- regular people that they don't know the extent of the complicity of the Canadian government. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's really important to also emphasize what you said, that, you know, it is really donations and people shouldn't expect uh, to uh, get them, get their uh, money worth, uh, because uh, Israel is also shameless and they might stop the shipment of going out, although their excuse before was they, they don't want the boats to smuggle arms. Would they say that uh, again for the Gaza Ark, you think? They don't want well, to smuggle arms. Well, <laughs> they should be well, happy if you're smuggling know. arms out of Gaza, won't you? They should be happy if we take arms out. Of course, we won't take arms on board. Yeah. This is a nonviolent boat. Yeah. But, I know, uh, I know. We're, we're waiting to see what their excuse will be. Yeah. Of course, they, the Hasbara machine, the yeah. propaganda machine, yeah. always invents very uh, far-fetched stories about us yeah. and about everybody who supports Palestinians. Yeah. So, uh, and about Palestinians, of course. Yeah. Uh, so they will dream up something. I mean, we have to remember, they have full-time propagandists working uh, 24-7 to make up lies about us. So, yeah, they'll have uh, they will make up something, but it, they will they have to work harder because, yeah, of course, yeah. a boat sailing out yeah. cannot possibly threaten, even be portrayed as threatening the security of anybody. Yeah, yeah they'll have uh, something how, under their... Uh, how they will do it, I don't know. Yeah. But, you know, really, we have to sail not Mm. Thinking about what the uh, I would think yeah. about it. That's true. We don't worry about what the um, Israeli uh, the, what the occupier does because mm-hmm. we sail uh, as we said before. Our course when uh, Ihab and I and the others were sailing on the Tahrir, our course is the conscience of humanity, yeah. and that's where we have to keep our 
are eye focused um, and uh, if the occupier is smart, they would let us go um, but I'm not so sure that, that they're that smart. Yeah, I think they no. might have a, a, a limited imagination and uh, yeah. only think of excuses for uh, yeah. for stopping us. Yeah. But as I said, as soon as we cast off the first time from the port of Gaza, mm -hmm. imagine that. For the first time, anybody can remember an ocean-going vessel would be leaving that port. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was rebuilt in Gaza yeah. by Palestinian hands and yeah. Palestinian resources and filled with Palestinian goods for export. Yeah, all the it products. It happened for years. Yeah, all the with products. a whole range of products, agricultural products, handicraft products, mm -hmm. um, you know, representing purchases that people have already been paid for. So yeah. after that, it matters what happens, but we've already won. Yeah. We've already won an important victory just by casting off. Yeah, all the products are Palestinian, so it's significant yeah, to, to exactly. the world. Exactly. Uh, and uh, mm -hmm. a very important point that's made to us by our, our friends in Gaza, some of these products, uh, most of the products are from uh, Palestinian producers in Gaza, but there will also be products on board from all of Palestine. Mm -hmm. Because right now, Gaza is the port, the only port on the Mediterranean yeah. for all of Palestine. Yeah, it should so, be. Uh, this is a place where all Palestinians should be able to export from. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah. we have producers who are, per, uh, who are ready yeah. to purchase those goods. Yeah. It, so it, uh, it's, uh, it's a challenge. Yeah. You know, nothing, nothing is simple in <laughs> no. under these conditions. Yeah. But um, we are continually impressed by the ingenuity and the, the tenaciousness yeah. of the Palestinians uh, of Gaza, who, if they face the challenge, they find a way around yeah. it and another way around it and another yeah. way around it. Right? So we, yeah. we will get there. Yeah, and also, you know, I, I'd like to uh, tell our listeners, uh, um, I don't think many of them heard about it because of the blockade of the media. On, on November 30th, there was uh, really a mini-boat initiative. Could you tell us about it and how successful yeah. and empowering it was to the was. people and the kids in Gaza? Absolutely. So as I said before, one of the most hard impacts in Gaza is on the young people, and we really wanted to do something to, to build hope, not, not wait until next spring, but to build hope now in the, this, this fall and winter when, in the terrible conditions. So we had this uh, idea which came from there, from, from Gaza, to uh, send mini arcs, little model boats, 40 centimeter long boats, uh, into the sea with sponsorships from around the world. Uh, there were almost 200 of them with sponsorships from Europe, from North America, from Australia. Uh, more than a quarter of them actually came from South Africa. Uh, and they went out uh, on a beautiful day with, uh, you know, children who came to the port with their families to denounce the blockade. And they sent them out with the names of their sponsors and the countries, and in some cases the, the little flags. And this was wonderful image of all these tiny white sails out on the sea representing the hopes and, and dreams of uh, young people, mm -hmm. young, uh, young Palestinians in Gaza. Yeah. So this is uh, something we did uh, as part of our campaign to build the campaign for Gaza's mm -hmm. Ark, but also uh, to send a message of hope mm -hmm. and a message of defiance against the blockade. And who knows, maybe some of those boats uh, cross the Mediterranean, depends on the winds, doesn't yeah. depend on us. Uh, some of them might have washed up in Israel, but then, you know, they, they will know, too, what uh, these messages are. Some of them would wash the other way towards Egypt, mm -hmm. and then they, too, would know that the, the children of Gaza are there, and they're waiting on the shores, yeah. and they know that the sea is one of the routes to their freedom. Yeah. It's not the only one, but it's one of the routes. What kind of messages uh, they carried? Uh, do you have any idea? Um, it was mostly simple. It was to children of Gaza say no to the blockade. Mm -hmm. It's, uh, it's yeah. Uh, the, a, a simple message yeah. uh, that uh, we want our freedom, we want our freedom of mm -hmm. movement. Mm -hmm. um, you know, yeah. these were small children, they weren't even thinking yeah. about studying outside of Gaza yeah. in any cases. It's yeah. just the no. sea represents to them the, the chance to, yeah. to sail to and access the world. No, this is a um, great idea, actually, and uh, uh, it's impressive, you know, and I think it's empowering also for the children of Gaza who sailed these uh, mini boats, mini uh, arcs. Yeah, so, you know, um, uh, I think uh, also what's uh, impressive also is the list of uh, supporters and partners for the Gaza Arc. Could you tell us a bit about uh, those? So we have, uh, I mean, in a sense, our most impressive importers are sorry, importers supporters are the many, many uh, ordinary people, grassroots organizations, mm. 
uh, who who endorse us and who fund us and mm -hmm. uh, fundraise for us and raise awareness. But we also have some internationally recognized names like uh, uh, Trump and Alice Ford, the Irish of Desmond Tutu, mm -hmm. um, uh, Indian seed activists like um, uh, Vandana Shiva, uh, some politicians from other parts of the world, not so many from, from mm -hmm. North America, as it turns out, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, the only... Uh, well, no federal party that uh, will raise their voices for us, but we do have ex-federal politicians like yeah. Warren Aldman and uh, Jim Manley. Mm -hmm. uh, and we have provincial politicians like uh, Francois David and uh, Omar uh, Amerikade in Montreal, or mm -hmm. in Quebec Solidaire. So, uh, and also some well-known um, Jewish anti-Zionist activists like uh, Hedy Epstein. A Holocaust survivor who lives in the U.S. now. So, yeah. uh, in in France, we have support from the uh, Jewish Organization for Peace. Mm -hmm. So there's a, a range of um, yeah. supporters from uh, and, around the world, from artistic yeah. communities uh, and the activist communities. And, uh, but as I say, the the real base of our support is with yeah. grassroots organizations, with peace, peaceful, loving people of conscience everywhere yeah. in the world. And for people who want to know more about the supporters, uh, they are all listed on your uh, Absolutely. Uh, Gaza Ark. GazaArk, uh, dot org, yes. so G A Z A A R K dot O R G. Yes. Uh, you have the supporters listed there. You have uh, mm -hmm. information, some photos of the ark as uh, she's being rebuilt, the work that's being done. Because uh, one of the exciting things, of course, is seeing you know work in the in the port of Gaza, which has been so depressed and so deprived of mm -hmm. employment for so long. Yeah. Uh, and also at GazaArk dot org slash products, you have the list of uh, some of the products that businesses and uh, community organizations yeah. can, can purchase. Yeah, and so we encourage people really to, to, to go there and uh, donate because without people's donation, uh, uh, although, like you said, uh, uh, the the donations are coming, and uh, you you reached uh, more than half of your target. Uh, am I two right? Two we're, we're we're at about uh, two hundred thousand out of three hundred thousand, so yeah. it's about two thirds. Two thirds, yeah. Uh, yeah. Now, uh, just just getting up to two thirds. But yes, we need the continued donation support. We also need people to buy into it. But it's also it's always about raising funds and raising awareness, right? So everybody who makes a donation, even a very modest amount, mm -hmm. um, helps to spread uh, the word about it as yeah. well. Yeah. So we need people to talk about it and say, hey, I... Yeah. I support this. I have a piece of the ark. Mm -hmm. So when it's when she sails, when the boat sails, a piece of us, each of us, will sail with her. Yeah. And if she is attacked, then a piece of us is also attacked. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a it's a way to show solidarity uh, in a concrete fashion. Also, um, uh, you know, uh, I I talked about uh, the the partners. Uh, you mentioned about South Africa. Are they officially as partners or? Could yes. you we have the Palestine Solidarity Alliance in South Africa, mm -hmm. who were, as I say, the largest sponsor of mini arcs in November. Mm -hmm. uh, they have been raising money. You know, it's not a country with a lot of disposable income. Yes, no. there are many, many poor people there. But they have a mass movement like no other, mm -hmm. <laughs> like no other place that I'm aware of. You know, in Europe, there's some pretty strong support in in uh, Ireland and the Basque Country. Yeah. But you know, in South Africa, it's a real mass yeah. movement. I guess, uh, so. and. Uh, yeah. When they mobilize people, they mobilize a lot of people. Yeah, I, I guess uh, from their experience with apartheid, there they sympathize. Uh, uh, exactly, with, with, they understand uh, the apartheid and they understand yeah. that it's a long struggle. Yeah, and uh, they will. Uh, they are supporting our process now of rebuilding. Yeah. Uh, they supported, as I said, the mini arcs in the fall, and they will be purchasing further. And also, there are partners in Australia and uh, other in places. Australia. Yeah. We have Australian partners, there are U.S. partners, and in the European countries who participated in the flotilla. So we have Sweden and Norway. Of course, Sweden was the last boat that sailed in 2012, the yeah. Estelle, uh, where Jim Manley was from B.C. Mm -hmm. uh, we have partners in um, Greece. Italy and Greece and uh, Spain. Yes. So these are the, the countries with us in the Freedom Flotilla Coalition. We also have other partners who are perhaps less directly involved, but they still have campaigns in France, in Germany, and Ireland, and the U.K. Oh, so oh, that's uh, it's quite uh, widespread in Europe, mm. um, maybe a little bit thinner on the ground in North America, but this is, uh, this is what we need to work on. Yeah, yeah, that's great. And, uh, you know, again, we encourage our people to visit your website, Gaza Arc. 
www.gazaarkonwer.org gazaarkonwer.org and uh, they could uh, really find uh, go to products I guess uh, uh, yep. slash products it's and then slash products is great uh, there's uh, information there about donating but also about the products that you could mm -hmm. buy as we've had you know, individuals or groups of individuals, as I say, mm -hmm. community groups, associations, uh, solidarity businesses, mm -hmm. different kinds of purchases are yeah. possible. But uh, you can contact us there and uh, let us know yeah. um, what what interests you. And uh, yeah. we've also had people approach us about cargo of their own. So if people want to purchase, uh, you know, the very specific types of embroidery, which one of the beautiful things about the, the, the camps, it's beautiful and sad at the same time, but you have... Mm -hmm. uh, uh, these uh, heritage associations who will reproduce the the embroidery from the villages where their grandparents yeah. were uh, were ethnically cleansed, uh, you know, two generations ago, yeah. and they're still producing it in the camps. Yeah. And so we have people who say, "I want to buy this embroidery from this place." Mm -hmm. and, you know, we're welcome. Please, yeah, we're uh, we would just take uh, only a transportation fee to, and it would be our honor to put uh, your your goods from Gaza on on the ark, yeah. if you have the confidence that you want to uh, to sail with us and sail some yeah. merchandise with and us. And the so only money, only money goes to the workers who produce these exactly. products. Exactly, yeah. exactly. You make the transaction to purchase from them, and we are just the transport uh, yeah. Yeah. company. No, that that's great, uh, David, and uh, uh, really it's amazing work uh, what you've done with both uh, the Gaza boat and now the Gaza Ark. And uh, you know, I'll I'll give you one final uh, message to our listeners. Um, follow us at GazaArk.org, and remember that uh, raising funds is important. Raising awareness is even more important because yes. ultimately we can't forget the Palestinians in general, the Palestinian people, and especially the Palestinians. Yeah. Uh, and uh, what keeps hope alive is the solidarity of peoples of conscience uh, throughout the world. Yeah, and uh, and uh, I just might add that uh, also a concrete support is a nonviolent action is to support the BDS movement, which Probably. really because our government, like you said, uh, David, they are not going to do it themselves. So uh, our responsibility is really to boycott Israeli products and push Israel uh, to accommodate uh, um, the uh, uh, just solution for the Palestinian people. And as long as they're getting money from the U.S. and other places all over the world, they're not going to do it on their own. So do you think uh, that's a reasonable um, uh, uh, request from our uh, listeners? Yeah. So, okay, uh, David, keep up the good work. And again, it's pleasure talking to you. And, uh, uh, you know, we, we wish uh, the ARC uh, uh, all the best. And uh, hopefully it'll reach your target soon. So have, have a good night. Thank you so much, Hannah. And until the next time. Thanks. Thanks. And that was Hannah Kawas speaking with David Heap, a spokesperson for Gaza's ARC. And with that, we conclude another edition of The Voice of Palestine. I've been your co-host, Marian Kawas, and our final piece of music is by Syrian-American singer Michael Hart, entitled, We Will Not Go Down in Gaza Tonight. This song became a global rallying point during the 2008-2009 Israeli attack on Gaza, and on this fifth anniversary, we honor it for its simple yet profound tribute to the steadfast Gazan people. A blinding flash of white light lit up the sky over Gaza tonight. People running for cover. Not knowing whether they're dead or alive They came with their tanks and their planes With ravaging fiery flames And nothing remains Just a voice rising up in the smoky haze We will not Tonight, women and 
children alike Murdered and massacred night after night While the so-called leaders of countries afar Debated on who's wrong or right But their powerless words were in vain And the bombs fell down like acid rain But through the tears and the blood and the pain You could still hear that voice through the smoky haze We will not tonight